Thank you everyone for coming. We're going to get started today. We have Gina Campoli at VTrans and Jim Ryan here from CDC to talk a little bit about some of the road-related efforts for water quality following Act 64, including the municipal roads permit. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gina to get us started, and then we'll hear from Jim following Gina. Thank you. The prompt there. Yes. And then you can use the arrow or the mouse to move through the slide. Okay, I'm sure I'll screw it up. <laughs> I'll try not. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Gina Campoli. I'm the Environmental Policy Manager of VTrans. That's in VTrans Policy Planning and Animal Development. And in these slides, I'm going to describe VTrans roles and responsibilities. Am I blocking the view of the... Um, that looks here? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll go on the other side. I'm going to catch you. Okay. <laughs> Not moving. Okay. No, I do it. I'll do this one. Okay. Try again. No, slides aren't changing. Touch the screen. Touch the screen. Um, there it goes. Okay, we'll go with the fancy technology. So there are three major areas, and this is building on uh, VTrans' uh, historic responsibilities around water quality. So we have programs in place that we are building up, and that includes funding to address runoff from municipal roads, funding programs to help towns comply with the upcoming changes to the permits, permit program, Outreach and technical assistance, both through Vermont Local Roads and our district staff. And then the development of a TS4, State Roads General Permit, which is taking um, VTrans's stormwater responsibilities for the state system and thinking that in a more holistic manner. And I'll, I'll talk about more, more about that in a minute. So, of course, because it's Valentine's Day, or it's coming up to Valentine's Day, I thought it was really important to show this slide because our work cannot occur unless we have full integration of our programs at VTrans <laughs> and at and a and r It's not something that just happens. It's very deliberate, just like a marriage. We have to work at our coordination and collaboration. And it starts right at the top. VTrans' executive staff and senior managers meet for an hour every other Thursday morning at 8 o'clock. We met this morning and we talk about the various challenges and opportunities and programs that are going on within our agency and how we can do our work better together. That commitment is, uh, extends down through the organization at the staff level and at the technical level. VTrans right now has a very growing um, uh, environmental capacity. There's my role in policy and planning in the highway division within the, the area that, that permits projects. We have our own stormwater engineers, we have biologists, we have archaeologists and historic preservation people. We have experts who work all the time with folks at A&R. And then out in the districts through the maintenance bureau, we have water quality staff who are very engaged in, in the MS4 program and will have a growing role in the, um, in the TS4. And I, I'm, I threw this up just to show you the extent of our coordination. And I'll, I'll uh, quickly uh, explain how the VTrans executive staff are at the top. Members of the, member, the secretary sits on the Clean Water Board. Um, these are the various topic areas around which we're coordinating our activities. So there's external planning and coordination internal and external communications, financial management, performance monitoring, RPC coordination, agency permitting, municipal outreach and technical assistance, and municipal funding. And within all those areas, we have different work groups, we have different initiatives. I'm not going to go reading through them all now, but you can see some of them are what VTrans is doing, some of them are in consultation with a &R, and some of them are actually joint agency work groups that meet regularly. It's very vast. It involves multiple layers and multiple people within our organization. So to shift to um, the municipal, um, the municipal uh, funding programs, I just I threw this slide out here just so people understand the extent of the network. 
Um, in Vermont, we have 14,158 miles of roadway, and 10,705 miles of that is managed uh, by the municipalities. That's that's 75 percent. Now, if you laid all these roads out end to end, you could go across the United States several times. It's a lot of roads, a lot of uh, infrastructure for which we are responsible. So the towns play a big role. The towns are going to need um, these transportation assistance. So this year, um, I I want to show you the investment that's going into uh, municipal funding, um, and it includes the Better Back Roads program, which many of you are hopefully familiar with. It's now dubbed the Better Roads Program because we are going to be looking at paved roads as well as gravel roads. Um, it includes $440,000 within the VTRANS budget, $1.4 million is allocated from the Clean Water Fund, and another million that was in the transportation, a commitment was made in the transportation bill last year for FY17, 18, and 19. All of this, this $2.8 million is going to the Better uh, Better Roads program, and I'll get into more of the details of that program in a few slides. In addition, we have 1.1 million set aside within the Transportation Alternatives Program uh, for stormwater. That's a total of 3.9 million. Now, understand this is just the state and federal commitment. These grant programs have local maps that is going to come into play too. If you want to look at the total investment in in, in water quality and in, in roads, so. What are our, our priorities uh, now going forward within this um, these funding program? We want to build on our popular and successful programs that are easy to implement and make a difference. We want to do no harm to those great, to the Better Back Roads program, the Better Roads program. I'm going to slip into that, I'm sure. So do no harm, build on what we've done. Um, bring paved roads into the Better Roads program, as I said. Help towns, and this is so crucial, we want, to under, we, want, we want to help towns undertake the planning and implementation necessary to comply with the municipal roads permit. For example, erosion inventories and prioritization and improvements mandated by the permit. Now, in order to do that, we need to be in constant co coordination with DEC because they're just beginning to put pen to paper, and we'll be working with all of you, and, and, and Jim will get into that, as to what those requirements are going to be. Uh, we want to include tactical basin plan priorities and great selection criteria. So those those plans are really important to figure out where the problems are. So we want to make sure when we give money out, we're actually helping to address this problem. And then we want to establish program accountability uh, through performance monitoring. And we're working closely with, with DC on how technically we're going to be able to do that so we can see the effectiveness, better, better capture the effectiveness of our programs. So I'll quickly go through the, the, the this year's round of Better Roads program. Um, category A grants, these are for erosion um, inventories and capital budgets. They're going to be capped at $10,000 per project, so that's 8,000 state, um, 2,000 local, and it's going to be 10% uh, of that $2.8 million. We've got Category B, B grants, these are the, more the bread and butter of implementation. So a correction of erosion problems and stormwater mitigation and retrofits for both gravel and uh, paved roads. The kinds of work we're going to be looking at are um, stone or grass line ditches, turnouts, uh, stone check dams, splash pools, rain gardens, squirrel concentrator devices, dry wells, gravel wetlands, level spreaders, all those things that we know are the practices we need to address uh, runoff from roadway surfaces. They're capped at $25,000 per project with 20,000 state and 5,000 local, and that's going to be 50% of the 2.8 million. Category C grants are correction stream bank or slope related problems. Uh, examples of work are stream bank stabilization, restoration, stone line slopes. They're capped at $50,000. As you know, these tend to be more expensive, 40,000 state, 10,000 local. In order to be eligible for these projects, you need to be, have consulted with our engineers in the stream alteration program and that's 20% of the total program. And then finally, the Category D grants, which are structure and culvert upgrades, and this would be culvert and structure upgrades and replacements uh, and addressing head cut and gully stabilization. Those are capped at 50,000 per project, 40,000 state, and 10,000 local, and 20% of the 2.8 million. 
And then finally, uh, for the TA program, um, for those of you who are familiar with it, it's a, it's, it's a federal program that funds things like bike PED, um, some historic preservation, and also water quality. And as I mentioned previously, the legislature said, let's take 1.1 million of that and just dedicate it to water quality. It is for towns that can address compliance with sometimes complicated federal grant requirements. So it's for larger towns, they're bigger projects. In FY16, we're funding projects in Essex, Shelburne, South Burlington, and Fairfield. It's a, we've, we're, we're expending a total of 1.7 on those projects. It's a 20% local match. And it's going to things like detention basins, gravel wetlands, um, culvert replacements, and the construction of a salt shed in one of those towns. And then I'm going to touch on a really, a really important a part of our work, which is the outreach and education. There is so much expertise within VTRANS to share with local officials. And we have great established networks for that, the Vermont Local Roads Program. Hopefully you all from Waterbury have heard of local roads. And uh, we have networks. We have a great listserv. We've got a lot of, we've got the bones for communication. What we're doing is increasing the level of knowledge within the organization to be able to give, um, deliver stormwater assistance through Vermont local roads and through our, our district staff. Um, so we want to make sure people understand the availability of grants and how to apply the Better Roads program. And I guess um, they're going to be out in March uh, going around to towns and various venues and I can get more information about that, telling you what the grants are all about and how to apply. Um, we're coordinating with Jim Ryan at DEC in reaching out to municipalities regarding the permit and what it will consist of. There will be lots of meetings going on in the next six to nine months as we work out what those um, standards and the permit requirements will be. And then we're doing our, as I said before, our continuous and ongoing work with local officials through Vermont Local Roads. And I'll give you an example. In December, we had, a, we had 30 people, all primarily road foremen in the Northeast Kingdom, come to a meeting to talk about um, why is erosion a problem, what are the BMPs, and most importantly, what works and what doesn't work from an on-the-ground on perspective, from the experience of those road foremen in, in the Northeast Kingdom. And that model is going to be replicated around the state. We partnered with NBDA, with RPC, and Jim is obviously involved with it. And then finally, I'll quickly uh, talk about the TS4 general permit. It's, the draft is, is due out in April. Uh, it's going to address stormwater for the transportation network and all of our facilities, so all of our garages, salt sheds, those kinds of things, on a system-wide basis. Right now, we build a project, we get a permit. There could be a, pro a discharge of up street, up road, or down road of that project, but that's where we have the jurisdiction. Instead, we're going to take the MS4 model and we're going to look systematically across the network and try to, you know, address the problems first and do retrofits, and the feds are going to be our partner in funding those retrofits. So we'll prioritize improvements based on water quality benefits instead of whatever we happen to be building that year. We're going to grow from the MS4 region. We're going to work very closely, we already are, with DC in understanding the required planning analysis and performance monitoring that's going to be part and parcel. It's going to get fairly technical if we've got one, and we're trying to get another staff person uh, to help with this. And then, right now, we're grappling with the increased cost to the agency, what it all means. No Clean Water Fund monies will be used for compliance. It's all going to be coming out of, of the state and federal compliance. And I want to take questions, but I think maybe we should have um, Jim go. Would that make sense? Sure. OK. Navigate. <laughs> Yeah, should just go back. Morning, everybody, here in the room and in the uh, webinar world. Uh, I'm Jim Ryan. I'm with the stormwater section in the uh, DEC Watershed Management Division and running the new municipal roads uh, program and permit. And uh, here today to talk about my favorite topic, 
roads. Um, we try to uh, keep a little sense of humor when we're out there. I meet with a lot of crusty road foremen all the time. Um, and uh, I, I, it's one of my favorite parts of the job. It's my reality check. And they have a great sense of humor. And uh, we try to keep things real and, um, and, and get, get road foremen in, in, input along the way. Um, this is a good uh, picture. I stole this from uh, Joanne's uh, slideshow um, of why we're why we're here and why this um, municipal roads permit general permit is in place. Uh, it's a, a picture of uh, Lake Champlain right after Tropical Storm Irene, and uh, we can see the, the lake in the background and then uh, a major tributary coming in, uh, sediment latent build, and uh, we're here to talk about sediment, phosphorus, roads, and other water quality issues. Again, I borrowed this from Joanne's slideshow, but um, when, I, when I meet with uh, road foremen, town managers, regional planning commission folks, um, even if we take water quality out of the equation, it's in all of our best interest to, arrest, uh, to address a lot of these what we're calling road best management practices um, in addressing sediment, phosphorus, but also from a public safety perspective and a catastrophic failure um, in this case, uh, in these photos here. So a little bit of background um, with the Lake Champlain TMDL, total maximum daily load. Uh, essentially, uh, Lake Champlain uh, Basin watershed has been put on a phosphorus budget and um, so we had to look at some of the sources of phosphorus statewide from the different land uses. Uh, Tetra Tech consultants came up with a model of this uh, phosphorus source pie, if you will. And, um, and I wouldn't get necessarily hung up on the exact percentages, but more of the proportions. We have ag land, about 40% um, from this modeling exercise of the phosphorus contribution to Lake Champlain Basin. Stream bank instability, um, 20, a little bit over 20%. Even forest lands are up at 15%. Wastewater treatment plants, about 3%. And the balance uh, that we're here to talk about are the developed lands, which includes paved roads and uh, unpaved roads. And um, jump right into uh, where the Lake Champlain Phosphorus TMDL um, is obviously was put together to address water quality in Lake Champlain. Act 64, the Vermont Clean Water Act, <laughs> decided to take uh, take that uh, some programs and regulations statewide, including the roads program. And not only are we talking about uh, sediment and uh, phosphorus that has a tendency to, to bind uh, with, with sediment, but we're also uh, looking at uh, hydrocarbons. We're looking at oil and antifreeze from cars, trucks, heavy metals. Uh, salt, road salting, that could be a secondary uh, benefit to implementing some of these practices that we're going to talk about. Uh, these numbers here are a little bit different than Gina's, um, and only that they are, these numbers here include class four roads. So we have about 16,000 miles of road in the state, state road miles, state highway, and municipal with um, the state highway portion about 2,700 of those miles and the balance over 13,000 uh, being maintained by municipalities. Uh, this pie chart is just an interesting uh, representation of the different road classes. Um, class one is a very tiny portion of the municipal roads, a little bit over 1%. Those are generally your village center roads, um, main streets, with uh, a, lot, a lot of cases, they're, they're paved with catch basins and sidewalks. Class two roads are um, generally roads that connect multiple towns. Some, some cases they're paved, some cases they're gravel. Class three are most often uh, gravel roads. And then class four roads that are kind of uh, the headwater, I call them the headwater roads, and uh, the towns are not necessarily required to maintain or minimally maintain. But the, the, the big picture here is really about two-thirds of these roads are class three gravel roads. So as part of Act 64, the Vermont Clean Water Act, um, all of the uh, land uses in that phosphorus budget, the phosphorus pie was previously up there. Um, there are new programs and regulations for agriculture, 
is required agricultural practices for stormwater, um, for logging and forest lands, and new accepted management practices. Um, and as, as part of that as well, uh, but also the wastewater treatment facilities, um, we are required to come up with a first time uh, general permit for municipal roads. As municipal roads had to this, so far had not been uh, uh, regulated at all. Uh, we're required to come up with a general permit um, that is actually due at the end of this year, um, and then a final permit a year later, December 2017, and towns would start beginning to apply for coverage under the permit in 2018 with a, with a phase in uh, over to 2021, and I'll get into what I mean by a phase in. So the main purpose of the permit, the general permit, is to identify what we're calling priority road segments. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, within a town, and those, you know, in, in, in the broad sense, the priority road segments are those road segments or portions of roads that have the greatest erosion risk or water quality risk um, to an adjacent, an adjacent water body, whether that's a lake, a pond, a wetland, a stream, and try to identify those road segments that are the highest erosion risk. And um, inventorying those, and then applying best management practices where we need to. So as far as the priority road segments, we have um, this is a shot from our agency of natural resources, uh, natural resources atlas, and this is a, a layer um, under the watershed protection uh, layer, the stormwater. Under stormwater, uh, we have this road erosion risk analysis, and you can see on, on the uh, map here for Waitsfield, there are different colors, uh, yellow, green, red. Green, green is a low erosion risk, yellow a moderate, red a high. Uh, this is a GIS level assessment based on road slope, proximity to water, soil erodibility, um, whether there's an uh, undersized culvert there in place. And it just kind of gives you a general sense of what to look for, what towns can look for at this phase, um, especially if there's not a road erosion inventory in place. Um, to give a general sense of what, what are your, your, which roads are more at risk for causing erosion. And we're in the process of getting this field verified, hopefully in the next year or two for every town in the state where we would have these priority road segments identified for the town out in the field. So as part of uh, the general permit, there'll be <coughs> an inventory phase, a prioritization phase of those road segments, and then an implementation plan or a capital budget. A lot of towns already have road erosion inventories and already have capital budgets. That'll, that's what we're kind of wrapping into when we call this a road uh, stormwater management plan. It's really those components, identifying those priority road segments, inventorying those segments to see if they would meet our standards. I'll get into the standards in a minute. And then for the ones that don't meet our standards coming up, with an implementation plan with a, what we call a capital budget. So it's essentially comes up with restoration plans and cost estimates and, and a schedule. So again, this is our stormwater, road stormwater management plan. I just pretty much said all of this, but uh, we're, we're gonna ask towns to provide this. This is, this is essentially what the general permit will be, um, is this road stormwater management plan. So we get the questions a lot uh, from road foremen, like does, does a general permit mean every time I take the grader out, I need to uh, uh, get a permit from you? No, the answer is no, uh, it's a general permit. And we're really kind of just trying to identify what some of those higher road erosion risk areas are and try to put the best management practices, target them there. So if we have some road work to do, this says 15 years, it may, be, may go up to 20 years in our Municipal Roads Permit. Um, so, so this is, I, I thought, would be a good example for a town. What does this mean for a town? Um, what does a road stormwater management plan mean? What does a prioritization and inventory and capital budget mean for a town? And it, it, in this example, we found that the average road miles for municipalities in the state is about 50 miles. So that includes the different road classes, whether they're paved or gravel, class four or village center. And in this case, um, we've also, um, Beverly Wimple at UVM, Joanne uh, Garten here in the room, and others have um, studied the road connectivity of um, which, uh, which portions of town roads are actually 
in some way connected to a water body, uh, so the runoff from that road can directly be conveyed to a water body. And we're coming up with around 50% is about the average. So in this example, we have so we have 50 total road miles, and if we use that roughly 50% of those roads are priority roads, we already um, knocked that 50 in half down to 25 road miles. If a town has been aggressive and um, done inventories and started putting in these best management practices, in this example we said this, this town was, was pretty aggressive. Um, they put in uh, road best management practices, or what we're going to be calling the standards, on 15 of those 25 miles. So that would leave about 10 miles in this example uh, of road that the town would have to put in best management practices over a 20 year period. So that's at least where we're headed with the permit. In this case, so that, that amounts to about a half a mile of road would need to be upgraded a year over 20 years. This is Jim's mantra or guiding principles for the permit, and um, it seems to be well received when we meet with our partners at VTrans and the Regional Planning Commissions and uh, the League of Cities and Towns, and most importantly, the road foreman. Um, we want the practices to be targeted specifically to address water quality. We don't want to have to address every road mile in every town. So for those road miles where there's not a stream in sight or a lake or a pond or a wetland, it doesn't make sense for the best management practices to be applied to those road segments. So we want it to really address water quality in a targeted way. And we want it to be cost effective and easy to maintain. Ideally, the town road crew, if they have the right equipment, can do put in these best management practices themselves. And I, I've, I've kind of peppered in a bunch of these um, different practices in a lot of these slides. And we have a culvert header on the right and a stone line ditch on the left. So questions that have come up. Um, what are the what are the practices that would ultimately become our standards? Um, and for for towns out there uh, listening, um, a lot of these um, practices are in the existing Better Back Roads manual that uh, VTrans has, and that's going to be updated this year. Um, and it's also the standards in the Vermont Road and Bridge standards that are out there now. So it's really looking at uh, stone line ditches, grass line ditches, turnouts, culvert header stabilization, culvert outlet stabilization, um, looking at, uh, for more, more urban areas, looking at catch basin cleaning, street sweeping, uh, maybe maybe catch basin outlet stabilization, and we're looking at some uh, green stormwater infrastructure practices as, as an option for towns. That's a stone line ditch turnout picture there on the right. Um, so, so we have we have the priority road breaches, so we're in target those areas that are most vulnerable uh, to cause erosion to a waterway. So again, we want to take that the next level and target by road type. We're calling road type, which is a little bit different than road class. So we're looking at uh, breaking out the ro road types by we call them paved, curved. So that would be those again, mostly those village center roads that have catch basins. Um, paved, not catch basins or curved, and gravel, not class four, so mostly class three, some class twos, and class four. So it seems to make sense to have the standard match the road type, and we just want to be efficient, we want to be targeted, we want to make this common sense. Um, and, and the practices on the left-hand side are only examples. A lot of those are, uh, a lot of those practices there are in the existing standards or in the Better Back Roads Manual. This isn't set in stone, it's only meant to be an example that we're gonna match the practice by road type. We just had a meeting right before this meeting with one of our technical teams to look at um, the, what we're calling the paved curved road type and what, what standards or what practices make the most sense there. For example, it doesn't make sense that we have a road crown standard on a paved road. We're not going to ask towns to tear up their pavement to get a good crown in the road. But maybe when they when they're when they are going to go and resurface, um, then it might make sense to put put the new a good crown in. So the other kind of way we're going to target this is by where we are in the road cross section. So we have the different standards um, that would apply to the traveling. For example, we really we're trying to focus 
on getting water off the road as quick as possible. We want perpendicular flow of water off the road instead of water running down the middle of the road. So that's kind of the travel lane roadway part of the cross section. Then we have kind of the, the and also uh, removing the, uh, we call it the shoulder berm or greater berm. So we, the water can actually get off the road and we don't have that, that berm that prevents water from getting into the ditch. Then we have kind of the drainage ditch area where we have, whether it's grass line, stone line, check dam, um, and then we have what we also call kind of our drainage culvert standards. Again, this is a, uh, the picture on the, on the left is what we're trying to avoid, water running down the middle of the road. It's also a, a maintenance issue for towns. They're losing a lot of material. It's a cost issue for towns. And I, I think we're going we're to keep getting back at this. It's not just, this is not just uh, we'll only address water quality, but in the end, we'll wind up saving towns money. Different treatments, catch basins, and street sweeping for the more urban areas. So all, uh, as far as the permit goes, all roads, all municipal roads will be covered in the permit. Again, there'll be different standards and practices for different road types. Um, and so all roads will be covered, including class four. And, but the requirements for class four are gonna be a lot less stringent than for class three, for example. Um, we're not asking towns to crown their class four roads and to ditch the entire class four roads. And I we used this example the other day, a lot if we're comparing a class three gravel and a class four gravel, the class three gravel practices or what's gonna become the standards are more linear, linear in nature. We're looking at ditch lines. We're looking at crowning along a linear uh, implementation. And for class four rows, we're really looking at more point fixes, kind of that spewing gully. Um, that, that culvert that's hanging and causing, causing a lot of gully erosion downstream with a head cut, um, but more point fixes rather than linear fixes. And, and have some more flexibility um, for class four roads. In a lot of cases, if they're uh, minimum population, and some towns would prefer putting in broad based dips here on the right or water bars instead of drainage culverts and giving towns that flexibility. In-stream culvert replacements will not be covered in the permit. But drainage, culvert, drainage culverts will be. And, and that's if for towns that have adopted the existing standards, uh, drainage culvert minimum standards are in the existing standards. Um, but we also may require headers. Uh, so it's putting stone on the inlet and outlet side of culverts. And if we do have a perched or hanging culvert, that's causing downstream gully erosion that we're asking towns to have that be stabilized with what we call a stone apron or splash pad. As Gina mentioned, we work very closely at uh, DEC with VTRANS. We have meetings at least every other week, sometimes every week, sometimes more than that. Um, Gina and I have done this presentation uh, many parts uh, of the state already, um, and uh, we will continue to do so um, we want to make sure, we're trying to work to make sure that the standards in our permit, the municipal rules permit, would at least be compatible with the existing standards and we're, we're continuing to meet so we can do that. Um, their geographic application might be a little bit different. So what can towns do now? In, the, in our timeline, we said that um, draft permit is due at the end of this year, final permit due a year later. Towns begin applying for coverage in 2018, um, and then we'll probably gradually have requirements after that. So maybe in late 2018, a town would apply for coverage with an application fee, um, and um, there's also an annual operating fee. And maybe at that point, this is all maybe because we haven't developed the permit yet, but where we're headed, that in, in that first year, maybe a town just has to give us um, a map of their roads by road type. And DEC and our partners, VTRANS, Regional Planning Commission, uh, will help provide that information for towns. Maybe in year two, in 2019, towns would have to do an inventory of all their priority road segments with a capital budget and schedule. 
in year three, 2020, towns would begin implementing that, that capital budget or road stormwater management plan. So we're, we're trying to transition it in a little bit at a time, slow at first, so we give towns plenty of lead time. So what can towns do now? Gina mentioned lots of different funding opportunities available through VTRANS, uh, especially through the Better Roads program. Um, and uh, DEC also has some limited funding right now for towns that are interested in, we're trying to find out what towns need so we can help them with technical assistance with, with what they may need for equipment and for funding. And Gina covered the funding. Um, we're finding that towns may need specialized pieces of equipment. A hydro seeder always comes to mind um, or a portable screener so towns can uh, not only install stone line dishes, but they can clean them out. And that can be shared by multiple towns. So if there's um, a grouping of towns out there that needs equipment that is willing to share with other towns, and we have that model in place in Franklin County and Lamar County, and Fulton and Medway area, um, we're encouraging towns to apply um, in our next round of the ecosystem restoration grants. Um, and um, if towns are out there identifying their problems, and going out there and proactively fixing those sites, um, they're going to be ahead of the game and have to do less later. And the funding is here now. We know it's here now. We don't know, we don't know about three or four years down the road, but we know it's there now. And I kind of covered this um, about the different technical assistance and funding out there. I'm working very closely with the VTRANS Local Roads Program and we're setting up a bunch of workshops, and Gina mentioned our Roads uh, Roundtable Forum that we had one in St. Johnsbury back in December, and we have five more scheduled throughout the state. We want Road Foreman talking to Road Foreman and exchanging ideas and brainstorming about how to implement some of these practices, and they can really, Road Foreman really learn from each other, and how do they grade the road? What sort of equipment do they use? Um, do they compact after they, after they put the crown in? Uh, how are they, putting in a stone line ditch so silt doesn't get in the ditch. What size rock are they using? All of these little questions um, that we're finding that, that the best way for uh, one reformer to learn is from hearing from another reformer and exchanging ideas. So we're gonna do five more of those this coming year. Um, in addition to the Better Back Roads grant application workshops that the Local Roads Program is, is doing. Alan May is a great resource at the Better Back Roads or Better Roads Program. Um, there are a bunch of us, um, Myself and Alan and at the local roads program. <clears throat> in some cases, the regional planning commission, uh, transportation planners, um, and others, the district staff of VTRANS that can provide site visits and technical assistance as well. So where we're headed next, um, we're developing the standards. We're developing a draft permit. We have a technical team uh, that's helping draft the standards. We want it science-based, but we want it also cost-effective and, as I mentioned, easy to, relatively easy to install and maintain whenever possible. There's always exceptions to that. Um, we have a core team uh, made up of DC VTRANS staff, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, Regional Planning Commissions, um, that's guiding this process. Um, they're the key partners and players and how this will unfold. And I'm out there, uh, the reality check I mentioned are the meetings with the road foreman. And as I said, in Chelsea yesterday, we met with about 40 road foreman road crews. Um, the Regional Planning Commission, transportation planners, um, the road roundtable that I mentioned. So we're out there uh, quite a lot, a lot of site visits. Um, so we try to keep it real, and we want to make sure that this, we have everybody's input along the way. Uh, this is my contact information, my phone number, my email. We have a, a website with some frequently asked questions and fact sheets. This slideshow, or I should say a version of the slideshow is on this website uh, in a PDF form. And um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but we can we can, we can can open it up uh, and maybe have Gina come back up here. <laughs> Any questions in the room? No. You have uh, general format. Spreadsheet or guidelines for doing the initial inventory. We're all kind of doing the same, right? That back. 
Um, the, the question in the room uh, was if there was a standard format or template for the inventories that are going to be required for the permit. Um, we don't have a standard one yet because we want to develop uh, the, at least the draft permit and the draft standards so we know what's going to be required of towns so they can get a better sense when they're doing the inventory on those priority road segments if that segment meets the standards. Um, that's not to say the town shouldn't be doing anything now. Um, if, if towns are identifying and addressing road-related erosion in close proximity to a waterway, or that could impact a waterway, and documenting those sites, inventorying those sites, and trying to put the best management practices on those sites if they need them, that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we'll be looking for ultimately. The specific template, though, we do have, um, we did have a uh, watershed assessment template that was developed, what was developed before this permit was in place. So when I try to put that kind of on hold, but that could be used, but it'll be, it'll be revised a little bit later um, as we have the standards in place, because now we, have, we, have, we want the standards to be by road type, so we want the inventory to match what the standards will be. And what, we've, we've, what DC has indicated to us is the types of in inventories and prioritizations that we're, the towns have been doing under the Better Packers program in the past are the right thing to be doing. So you want to continue doing the, the windshield surveys, uh, the GIS work, the windshield surveys, the field visits, um, because most towns know where their problems are. It's just a question of getting out there, getting them on a map, and, uh, and then starting to prioritize funding to trust them. Yeah, That's been our experience. I strongly encourage towns to take advantage of the money while it's on the table. Um, it can really be ahead of the game when it comes to implementing this permit and the requirements of the permit. It's a really good time. Again, if we took water quality off the table here, if towns just wanted to address the bad roads in town, now's a really good time to do that. And But where the connection is the, the, the hitch is there'll be uh, a requirement in the grant for the addressing erosion uh, for roads that are connected to a street. You know, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that erosion is a problem regardless of whether it's going to end up in the, in the river because when the big floods come, you can lose your roads if they're not properly treated. And uh, so the transit interest is to save town money and to make these roadways more resilient to future flooding, which we know is coming, mm -hmm. as well as cleaning up, cleaning up the, uh, the phosphorus problems. One thing that I didn't mention was we put together a, a chart that has all the grant opportunities, so it has the things that I mentioned, as well as the Ecosystem Restoration Program, and as well as the, the mainline VTRANS municipal funding, the Town Highway Bridge and Town Highway Road Program, which do bread and butter transportation work and sometimes have a water quality benefit. So I can make this available to the people who are watching from afar. We just finished it today. It's a, the district, our district staff were saying towns really just need a one-stop shop of where, where the funding is. So that'll go out. Along with a brochure that I also handed out that really just synthesizes and has phone numbers of everything that we just talked about um, today. So I'll also make that available to you. Those of you out in Greenland or Wedland or whatever it's called. Questions? We have a question on the line. So on the Natural Resources Atlas, it appears that many of the roads identified for road erosion risk uh, are privately owned roads, driveways, or parking lots. And will the town be responsible for these under the municipal road general permit? Uh, yes, as part of the, well, yes, that's. Some private roads and driveways have been identified on, on the Natural Resource Atlas, the road erosion risk ranking. Um, again, that was done before we had this permit in place or the requirement. Um, but no, towns will not have to um, address erosion from private drives. So this is strictly municipal roads, paved, unpaved, all road classes, but not private roads and driveways. One issue that we've been grappling with is runoff from agricultural fields that ends up in public um, infrastructure. So we've got to deal with that. We're having been having conversations with them in the context of the league and with the ag agency, and we're hoping um, to figure that out in the next several months in terms of how those areas are going to be treated. 
because there's farm runoff in areas like Addison County, Franklin County, Orleans County that's ending up in municipal and state ditches. And how do we deal with that? Who deals with that? And we are we are limited in, in the municipal permit that we really only have jurisdiction be, um, within the road right of way. So kind of what happens on the uphill side and on the downhill side of the right of way is cut out of this permit purview. That's not to say that, that those issues shouldn't be addressed, but they might have to be addressed through the required agricultural practices or the accepted management practices for logging, um, or through town municipal ordinances or encouraging towns to have uh, have strong uh, driveway ordinances as a way to address some of the non-municipal road issues. We have another question kind of related to that, so it's, but I think you may have answered it, that um, the state is not going to be issuing a private road permit at some point down the line. Uh, but then following up on that, does the state of Vermont have total mileage of private roads? Um, I can get the number, the second question for a second, I can get that number for that person, um, um, a ballpark number, uh, private roads, but um, it's it's not in the foreseeable future as far as regulating private roads. New new private roads that are over an acre in size of disturbance would trigger um, our stormwater permitting though. So for as far as new roads and that that threshold might get reduced to a half acre that they're having discussions about that in the future, which would apply to new driveways. Are there any other questions in the room? Okay, we have one more in here. Um, could a municipality get credit for requiring or implementing fixes on driveways instead of repairing their own roads, especially where more cost effective? Uh, I, I, I say no. I think it sounds like a good idea, but it's a new one. Um, but because it's almost it's almost like a uh, sediment phosphorus trading. Um, um, as it stands now, no. Although we don't want to not encourage towns to, <laughs> they want to do that. But we do, we do. I did mention to, uh, did, didn't mention that DEC does have a, a very limited amount of funding for uh, some private road driveway erosion issues related to water quality through our ecosystem restoration grant. Um, it's thirty thousand for the year, um, so it's it's a, it's a it's a very limited pot, but there's of money, but there is some money available. Lots of questions coming through here. Um, one more, turnouts are recommended and a good idea, but often require additional land outside of the town or state right of way. Is there any special funding being made available for acquisition of this additional right of way for turnouts? I'm gonna ask, turn to the next I know, I, 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 uh, Most, as folks know, uh, Gina went over a lot of different funding sources, uh, mostly on the VTRAN side, um, it was, uh, a lot of the clean water funding, there's decisions made that the vast majority of the financial assistance to municipalities would go through VTRANS, with the exception of the shared equipment uh, grant that I mentioned earlier from DEC. Um, so. You know, that's a really good question, and I don't have the answer. I know turnouts are something that we fund um, pretty regularly, but whether the question of acquisition of right away come up. I, I don't know the answer. I will get back to that person if you can figure out who it is. That's a really interesting one. Um, I know sometimes when we do culvert replacements, we're having to um, get involved in property line issues in the municipal level. So, But whether the funding can actually go to purchase those rights, I don't know. We're kind of slowing down with questions okay. here. Are there any other questions in the room? Folks on the line, if you have any last minute questions. Uh, oh, one more just came through. Has there been any discussion on retro permitting shared private drives for more than X number of homes? Um, not through this permit. Uh, it might get triggered in the new stormwater permitting, especially if that threshold drops uh, to a half acre. Okay. All right, folks on the line, last call for questions. Oh, here comes one. 
okay. Are there other consultants who are capable of conducting hydraulic analyses as there seems like a backlog of receiving assistance with this? Hi. Hydraulic? Um, do they mean for the Better Back Roads grant applications? or? Um, I'm not sure. Metrans will do hydraulic analysis for town culvert replacements. Are they referring to that that we're funding through our town bridge program, town roadway program? When we think hydraulic, we're thinking culvert, culvert uh, technical assistance. Or maybe I'll unmute Ethan so he can clarify. Okay. Ethan, you're unmuted if you'd like to clarify your question. No, it was a question that came from towns about culvert replacements. Okay. Is there a backlog at B-Trans right now with the Nick work? I'm, I'm only passing along what I heard. Um, that there was concern that there was not enough people who were capable of doing the amount of hydraulic analyses that are needed. Hmm. I heard a rumor there was a new job announcement <laughs> out uh, recently for that to, for additional staff. I was a just rumor. wondering if there's uh, are there qualified consultants to do that also, or is that just oh, yes, yes, yeah. Trans, yeah. Uh, many en any engineering firm can do that work. Uh, and I've, I've heard that before. Maybe um, it might be helpful. Maybe between VTrans and DC, we can come up with a list of consultants yeah. that can do not just the uh, culvert sizing, but some of the um, better roads type of uh, grant applications. There's the regional planning commissions, the conservation districts. There, then there are uh, private consultants out there as well. Um, well, I would think the stream alteration program would be the first place to go to. Um, <coughs> uh, my client and his staff would be of, of value to you. But I'm interested in knowing if, in fact, it's Z-Trans slowing down in terms of our, because we're very proud of the fact that we assist towns in doing these hydraulic analysis. And if there's a problem there in terms of timing, it'd be good to get some feedback on that, on that issue. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank Sounds you, everybody. like a good time to wrap up. I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that the next of our brown bag series will be held on Thursday, March 10th, and we're going to be hearing from Brian Redmond on the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. So, hope you can join us and we'll be sending out details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.